A young woman arrived in the parking lot of her school to go to a sporting event and disappeared without a trace. Soon, a very creepy discovery awaited everyone and the police got involved in the case. It took detectives a full 28 years to solve this creepy mystery and none of them had any idea that this case would be the first of its kind. Sarah Yarborough was born on June 12, 1975 in Portland. Her parents soon moved to another state, settling in the town of Federal Way. It is near Seattle and is essentially a suburb of it. Sarah also had two brothers and helped her parents take care of the younger one and was very close to him. From an early age, Sarah was involved in music and ballet. The girl always strived to do well in school so she could get into a good college. Because of her academic performance, she flew twice to New Zealand in the school program. Later, Sarah joined her school's cheerleading team. She also had a great many friends. She was a kind and non-confrontational person trying to help anyone in need. On Saturday morning, December 14, 1991, when she was 16, Sarah gathered for an event with her cheerleading team. They were to gather at the school building where the bus would pick them up. She took her dad's car and drove to school, only Sarah got the time wrong. She thought the bus would pick them up at 8 a.m., when in fact it wasn't supposed to arrive until 9. All her friends gradually started arriving at the place but none of them saw Sarah. Some students saw her car in the parking lot, but there was no young woman inside, not even when the bus arrived for the students. Her friends thought this was strange, but no one could contact Sarah because none of them had cell phones at that time. Around the same time, two 12-year-old boys were walking around the school grounds, walking through the wooded area behind the school tennis courts they noticed a strange man. He came out from behind the bushes, looked at them, and walked away in the opposite direction. He seemed strange to the children, but they did not pay much attention and walked on. Just a few meters away, a shocking sight awaited them, a young woman lying on the ground with no signs of life. Thinking she was dead, the school children ran home to tell their parents. While the parents of one of the boys went with him to the place, the father of the other decided to follow the suspicious man the children had seen. His son told him that he saw a car that looked like a Chevrolet Nova pulling away from that spot. Given that he lived near the school, his father decided to go outside and try to track down that car. At one point, he managed to locate a similar car but it quickly disappeared from his sight and the man was unable to find it again. Meanwhile, the other boy's parents came to the school and realized that the young woman on the ground was probably dead. They immediately ran to the school building and called the police. Officers arrived on the scene and confirmed that the young woman was indeed dead. They were also quickly able to determine that the deceased was Sarah. From the marks on her neck, the officers concluded that the victim had most likely been strangled. Next to the body was some of her belongings, a jacket, underwear, and socks, with no other items near her. Officers found her purse and car keys inside the car in the school parking lot, leading them to believe that the perpetrator may have attacked her directly next to the car and then dragged her behind the trees. The body was turned over to medical examiners and the police set about looking for clues. The first thing they did was try to interview all the people who were on and near the school grounds. The two guys who found Sarah gave a rough description of the man who had come out from behind the bushes near her body. They said he was a tall man in his early 20s with shoulder length blonde hair a dark raincoat, and black pants. Soon the police found another witness, and here a very surprising story awaited them. A man out for a jog noticed a strange picture in the same wooded area. A young woman was lying next to the bushes 
with a man hovering over her, and the young woman was not moving at all, and the witness thought that some couple had just decided to have some privacy. A few minutes later, he ran down the same road in the opposite direction, and the man and the young woman were still there. In both cases, it did not appear to him that he was watching a felony being committed. The witness himself explained to the police that he had only recently immigrated to the United States from another culture and was not sure what behavior was the norm in that country, but nevertheless, this witness gave the police a rough description of the killer, which matched the words of the children who discovered the body. Detectives interviewed several dozen other people who had been near the school, but no other useful leads were found. Meanwhile, medical experts examined Sarah's body and concluded that strangulation was the cause of her death. Apparently, the perpetrator used her own pantyhose. In addition, a serious injury was found on the young woman's head. The experts assumed that from this blow, the victim lost consciousness, which was consistent with the runner's story. He saw that the young woman on the ground did not move at all. Forensic investigators studied Sarah's clothing, and on almost every item, they found traces of male semen belonging to the same person. But in 1991, there was no common DNA database yet, so all the investigators could rely on was a direct comparison of DNA samples from specific suspects. There was another nuance that was brought to the detective's attention. Even though forensic scientists found traces of male semen on Sarah's clothes, medical examiners stated that there were no signs of sexual abuse on her body. With all this information in hand, investigators formed their own view of what happened. Sarah arrived at the school almost an hour early and there was no one in the parking lot but her. Her attacker most likely spotted her there, waited for the young woman to get out of the car, hit her on the head with an object, and Sarah lost consciousness. He then dragged her from the parking lot behind the trees where her body would later be found. The perpetrator removed some of her clothing and performed lewd acts on her before strangling the victim with her own stockings. When one of the children, who found Sarah's body, told police about the car in which the perpetrator allegedly fled the scene, detectives put out a search for a Chevrolet Nova and soon they were able to find her. But here they were disappointed. It turned out that the driver of that car had just been delivering donuts that morning. He provided his DNA sample, which did not match that found on Sarah's clothes. Apparently, the kids just saw the car that drove down the road next to them and thought the perpetrator was behind the wheel. In fact, none of the boys could recall exactly whether they saw a man approaching any car from the bushes. Over the next few days, police continued to search for witnesses and new leads, but no significant progress was made. On Monday, school classes resumed even though all the students were horrified by what had happened. In addition to the fact that the murder had taken place only a few meters from their school, the perpetrator was still at large, and his identity remained unknown. The young women were afraid to walk the grounds alone, so the boys on the sports teams arranged to walk each student to her car or bus so they would not be left alone on the street. Detectives determined that there were about 70 potential witnesses in and around the school that morning and they talked to each of them, but no new details could be learned. Based on the accounts of the two children and the jogger, a rough portrait of the killer was compiled and distributed to all local newspapers and television stations. The story received extensive media coverage and over the following weeks, the police received hundreds of tips. Investigators checked every one of them, but in all cases, they hit a dead end. At one point, they received a tip about a man who matched the killer's description 
and had a criminal history, but here the detectives had a setback. His DNA did not match the perpetrator's sample. Since then, the case has been stalled for many months. In total, the police received about 4,000 different leads and they tried to work with each of them, but the resources of the local police department were simply not enough to cope with so much information. Time also played against them, even as the investigators continued to search for the perpetrator and each month there were new cases to be investigated. When Sarah's family learned that the police didn't have enough resources to handle all the tips, her grandfather tried to help as much as he could. He worked for a technology company and convinced management to temporarily provide the police department with a very powerful computer worth $150,000. It was a colossal sum in the 90s, but management still went along with it. With this computer, police officers could store information about all the leads in one place, process them at an increased speed, and sort them in a convenient form for quick study. Despite all this, every lead led them down a dead end and they made no progress in the years that followed. Two years later, Sarah's classmates graduated and before graduation they decided to memorialize their friend. They raised an impressive sum of money and spent it to create a memorial. It was a bench on which Sarah's things were cast in metal. Next to these things, there was also a picture of the young woman's dog reaching for her purse. Over the years that followed, the case was periodically reopened, re-examining all the available evidence, but the result was the same. They were still unable to get any closer to catching the culprit. During this time, the police interviewed several thousand people and took DNA samples from nearly 300 possible suspects, but all this was inconclusive. In 2011, 20 years after the murder, the new detective decided to enlist the help of modern technology. He heard about a company that began working in the field of genetic genealogy. The policeman contacted them and asked, could they try to locate relatives of the person who left his DNA on the victim's body? And the experts undertook the task. Unfortunately, they failed. First of all, in 2011, Genetic genealogy was just gaining momentum and the experts were very limited in their capabilities. For example, they have not learned to search for male and female relatives in one sample. If they had the DNA of a man, they could only look for family ties with other men and vice versa. Secondly, they had another obstacle in front of them in the form of various laws that prohibited the use of genetic data samples to search for relatives of suspects. Nevertheless, it bore some interesting fruit. For one thing, the team of researchers approached by the detective had already been working for several years to create a genetic pedigree of the first people who sailed to the United States from Great Britain in 1620 on the ship Mayflower. After studying the DNA of the killer Sarah, they discovered that the man was related to one of the ship's passengers, Robert Fuller. However, it was almost impossible to trace him through this chain, especially in those years. There were just over 100 people on the ship, but over the centuries, the number of their descendants has exceeded 25 million. And secondly, the detectives had no idea that he had made the Sarah Yarborough case the first of its kind. Although his idea was not successful, it was the first crime that was attempted to solve with the help of genetic genealogy. The detective tried to use the information available and track down several men with the Fuller surname who were living in the area of his town at the time of Sarah's murder. He found photos of them and met the only witness, a jogger and two men who had found the body as children. Unfortunately, neither of them recognized the killer in the photo. Finally, the investigators asked for DNA samples from all Fuller in the area and sent them to the laboratory. None of them matched the DNA of the killer. 
but something interesting happened here. The experts established that one of those men was indeed a distant descendant of Robert Fuller from that very ship. However, he was definitely not the killer and also did not know that any distant relatives lived near him. The perpetrator may have been so distantly related to him that their family simply never knew of the connection. The detective retired in 2017 and the case was turned over to a new team. Investigators revisited the company which had taken on the killer's DNA sample in 2011. By that time, the ability to study genetic material had advanced a great deal and experts agreed to try to trace the perpetrator's lineage. It took two whole years. The experts used public databases to find even the most distant relatives of the killer. Then they manually tried to trace their family ties and reach people who lived in federal way at the time of Sarah's death. In all, they had to weed out several thousand people before they finally got lucky. Experts determined that a DNA sample from Sarah's clothes was highly likely to belong to one of the two brothers. At the time of the murder, one was 33 years old and the other was 27. The older one turned out to be a criminal with an impressive criminal record. He had been in prison for violent crimes and his DNA sample was in the FBI database, which meant that he had nothing to do with Sarah's murder because then his DNA would have shown a match back in the 90s. As for the younger brother, named Patrick Nicholas, he too has been on the police's radar for violent crimes, including crimes against minors, but that was before the DNA samples of such criminals were added to the database. Detectives immediately organized a surveillance of the man. The man, who was 55 at the time, lived in a neighboring town called Wellington. The cops had been following his every move for two days and soon the opportunity presented itself. Patrick went to the laundry and while he was waiting for his clothes to be washed, he went out to smoke and threw his cigarette butt on the ground. One of the cops immediately took it into an evidence bag and returned to his car. Patrick went out to smoke a second time and this time a rag handkerchief fell out of his pocket. The men didn't pick it up and went back to the laundry room and the police were happy to take the second piece of evidence in case the experts were not able to get a DNA sample from the cigarette butt. However, the experts were easily able to extract samples from all these items and the very next day they told the detective the long-awaited news. Patrick's DNA was a perfect match to the semen found on Sarah's clothes in 1991. The judge immediately issued a warrant for the man's arrest and the police took him into custody. It all took five days from when investigators first learned his name to the formal murder charges. When his biography was leaked to the media, many began to ask the perfectly logical question. Why was a man with such a criminal history not even considered a suspect for all those 28 years. At age 19, Patrick Nicholas approached a young, young woman and got into her car where he tried to abuse her. The victim managed to escape and escape, but to do so, she had to jump into the river and swim for a long time until she was a safe distance from the perpetrator. Patrick spent four years in prison after which he was released. The next crime that the police caught him for was in 1994 when he tried to abuse an underage young woman. He was arrested again, but his DNA was not entered in any database. The reason for that is strange. The article he was prosecuted for was not hard enough to collect DNA and the police never came across his name in three decades. He also didn't appear in any of the 4,000 leads obtained over the years. It also turned out why genetic genealogy experts could not trace him back to Robert Fuller. It turned out that Patrick's biological grandfather was adopted and grew up under the adoptive family name. One of the men who discovered Sarah's body as children in 1991 
immediately stated that Patrick was without a doubt the killer. He admitted that the incident had had a profound effect on him. He was only 12 at the time the body was discovered and the perpetrator had seen his face. For years, the witness was constantly afraid that the killer would come after him, and it was only after Patrick's arrest that he finally felt safe. Patrick's trial did not begin until 2023. The man insisted on his innocence and his lawyer tried to challenge the main evidence, DNA. In his opinion, the presence of Patrick Seaman on the clothes of the murdered young woman did not prove his guilt. But this argument did not work. The lawyer also tried to challenge the accuracy of the DNA analysis itself, but the experts declared the absolute invalidity of such claims. Patrick was eventually found guilty of first-degree murder without prior intent. On May 25th, he was sentenced to 45 years and 8 months in prison, virtually eliminating the possibility of ever getting out. During the pronouncement of that sentence, Patrick showed no emotion, unlike Sarah's relatives. They also spoke before the judge, thanking everyone involved in the trial and the investigators for bringing the killer to justice, even though he had managed to evade justice for 28 years. Share your opinion on this story in the comments, and don't forget to like the video if you liked it. Thanks for watching.